Oh, this is the microphone. That's very cool. <laughs> Awesome. You have to understand, we have right in front of us uh, the live stream, so we're watching ourselves, even if we're talking to you, and it looks like we're on like one of those like radio talk shows, which you have like big headsets on. I need like a blinder. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I'm like, can we just block out me, and I can just look at her here and here. Okay. So I am so freaking excited to talk to you, and I think many people are freaking excited to be here to see you talk. Um, you guys have to understand, I moved to Chicago from New York City. And I'm not going to say that a key factor was the fact that Lucy Knivesley was local, but I'm not not going to say that <laughs> at the same time. Um, so my first question is, how awesome are you? You are so awesome. Uh, you have here a little, a little pile of some of your books. And if you guys are not familiar with Lucy's books, if you just wandered into this room randomly and thought, these two people at the table look like fun. Uh, we are. And her books are amazing. So the books that I, you've written that you would call, these are just three of them here, but she's done so many. I would call, so I think the books that you would call memoirs would be French Milk, Relish, An Age of License, Displacement, A Travelogue, Something New, Tales of a Makeshift Bride, and this year's Kid Gloves, Nine Months of Careful Chaos. So you've done more than one, I would say, comic book memoir. What is it about the comic book memoir that you like so much? Well, <clears throat> I think part of it is that it's what I do. Right. And uh, I got started doing this when I was a deeply introspective child uh, whose parents were uh, a writing and literature professor and an artist and chef. And comics became my way to kind of combine these things that were instilled from my parents and a way to process the world that way. Um, I, I don't want to say that I was like deeply affected by my parents' divorce and that that's like why I try and meld the two, but I'm sure that has something to do with it. <laughs> um, so I started like, we started making comics like right around the same time. Uh, and then I thought that I would have to choose. I thought that I would have to go with writing or art as like a real profession someday. And that, didn't happen for me. I actually chose art and I went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago here in town and thought, okay, I'll be a painter. That's a real profession. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I thought that was more or less real than anything else, but I was like, yeah, painter, sure. Um, so I started studying painting and then immediately was making comics all the time on the side. And that's when it kind of clicked for me that I could, I could do that. That could be my real profession. And I started making comics uh, from a very lonely, very shy place in my life. And it was a way to reach out and connect with people that had a shared experience or found something to identify with in my work. And that was this huge light bulb moment for me that this was a way for me to kind of reach beyond this shy, introspective self and connect with a human being. So that's where the impetus came from behind the graphic memoirs. And that's where it continues to come from even now you know, many years on in my career. I want to double back on something you just said. So you're a kid and you start making comic memoirs as a kid, <laughs> but those didn't exist. I mean, all we, we see a bunch of them today. We see like El Defo by C.C. Bell, you know, we, we see, um, you know, uh, Real Friends by Shannon Hale. Like oh, right now, we're beginning to see like for kids, there are comic memoirs of these authors when they were kids. Um, you know, Be Prepared by Vera Brosdahl. But they weren't, like when you and I were kids, like what comics did you even see? I mean, where did the idea come from to make a comic of your life? All children's books are comics. Ah. <laughs> um, I, I, this is what you start out reading when you're a kid. You start out reading words and pictures combined. And it's, in fact, like the basis of human communication. It's what we started communicating with in terms of cave paintings. Uh, sequential narrative pictures is something that we all sort of start out thinking in. And so when I was little, actually, I would read a book that freaked me out, <laughs> um, like a children's book that freaked me out. Actually, one in particular that my mother has saved um, <laughs> that was a, uh, a book that was like, you know, amazing snakes. And it was just pictures of snakes and like facts about them. And I am phobic of snakes. I can like look at a picture of a snake and be okay. But if I see one, I have to like leave the building. 
So, so it like, and, and I have nothing personally against snakes. I, I like think they're great and they eat bugs and stuff. They're important, but, but I just, I have a phobia and I, I, when I was little, I still had this phobia and I read this book and I was trying to like cure myself of my fear of snakes and I read it, but it totally freaked me out and it went inside me and I was like, I have to process this somehow. So I'm going to make my version of amazing snakes. And I, uh, I took like, you know, paper from the printer and I folded it in half and I stapled it and I made my first zine, which was called Amazing Snakes because I didn't understand copyright infringement at the time. <laughs> and uh, Can't so copyright a name. Yeah, oh, there, you go. there you go. Okay, yeah. I could still do a book called Amazing exactly. Snakes. <laughs> so it's called Amazing Snakes and it was just drawings of these snakes that I had seen that had freaked me out and like little facts that I think were made up about the snakes. Like, you know, this one likes eating taffy and... Um, and my mom still has this zine that I made about snakes. She was like, she was really impressed that I was trying to like deal with my fear in this way <laughs> where I was like, I'm going to just make a book about it. And that's like, that's exactly what I do now as an adult. So I think it's so incredible and so wonderful that kids are seeing graphic memoirs now. And it's, it's sort of being this kind of connections are being made between people telling personal stories in sequential narrative imagery. Uh, but for me, it was just like, that's how you tell a story. You just take a picture and combine it with words. And that's how you kind of like say what happened to you. So for me, it started with picture books. It started uh, early on uh, also with comics like Calvin and Hobbes and um, what else? Uh, the for better or for worse, amazing. So, uh, so for me, it, it was never like one or the other. It was just like, this is how I have to tell the story. Yeah. You're giving me so many good ideas for blog posts here because <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of this. So you mentioned For Better or For Worse, which may be the only comic strip memoir by a woman because Flynn Johnson did base that strip on her own life, right? Yeah. And then there was Kathy, written by Kathy. Um, and if you were a girl growing up and you wanted to see women writing comics, those were pretty much the two games of town. Nicole Sylvia. Hollander. Yeah. Oh, Nicole. Yeah, I was going to say Nicole Hollander. Sylvia. Cannot forget Sylvia. <laughs> um, but beyond those, yeah, that was like the beginning. It's that or Beetle Bailey then. Um, oh, Linda Berry too. Oh, Linda Berry. Oh, yeah. oh, you cannot forget Linda Berry. Exactly. So then you were talking about how like picture books were the, like, the original, but picture book memoirs are now taking off too. Um, and I had, those did not exist when we were kids. They're existing now almost entirely by men, which is very interesting. So you've got like Bill Joyce doing Billy's Booger, and uh, there's a new one coming out from Chris Gall about the moon landing when he was a kid then, and then there was like uh, Shake, Rattle, and Roll uh, by Mark Allen Stamady. We're not seeing them from women so much, which is very interesting, and I don't know what that means. Hint, 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 hint. <laughs> um, so when you are writing your comic memoirs, who are other like comic memoirs um, for either kids or adults that you really like? Um, I have so many, <clears throat> but um, Linda Berry, Nicole Hollander, uh, obviously, um, I love them so deeply. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was really lucky that I came sort of into the graphic novel world at a time when women in comics were kind of exploding and, and uh, people like Raina Telgemeier were starting out, Vera Braskal, we mentioned. Um, Hope Larson, um, all of these amazing people that are still my friends and colleagues today. And we started out going to conventions like this, um, not quite like this, much smaller and <laughs> in a tent usually. Uh, and, uh, and frequently we were all dumped on the same like women in comics token panel kind of thing. So we got to be really good friends because we'd be like, this sucks, right? Yeah, this sucks. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Uh, and we were all really excited and really supportive of each other's work. And it was so amazing to have that coming into comics because people like Alison Bechtel, who's also like this great idol of mine, didn't have that when they were coming into comics. They didn't have this community of women. And now it's this huge, amazing community of women. And we're not just on women in comics panels anymore. We're not just in diversity in comics panels anymore. And it's, it's so great to see um, because so, in answer to your question, I've been really lucky to have so many incredible uh, role models in this career and uh, people that are also peers of mine that I can, uh, you know, Jillian Tamaki is uh, incredible and um, oh God, there's just so many. Jen Wang is so good. So I just see 
I see it exploding all over the place. It's so great. It's so interesting. You were mentioning like you were going to school for painting and then you were doing comics on the side. And I'm trying, I'm like sitting here this entire time, like racking my brain, like painters that have become comic artists, painters that have become comic artists, painters, I cannot come up with any. Can, can you come up with any? Anyway, you don't have to now. It's okay. <laughs> like we're going to pause for like 10 minutes while she thinks about it. But okay, so when you're writing a book, and, and you do it. Um, what are you trying to avoid doing? I mean, you are basically, you are taking your life and you are turning the messiness of life into a story with a beginning and a middle and an end. And life is messy and it doesn't have these neat little like, this is the beginning, this is the middle, this is the end. So basically you have to render yourself in comic form and you have to give your past a sense of purpose that it may not have had at the time. So, simple question, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's important uh, both for storytelling and for mental health reasons to uh, create some kind of separation between the character that you're portraying and the self. Uh, so I think that's part of it. But, um, but also, this is most difficult in my travelogue work because uh, I, I tell a story in travelogue form and it's just like, a trip, you know, and you're, you're writing as you go, you might not necessarily find a deeper meaning, and those are the stories that maybe don't get published. But if you go on a trip and you sort of look for a theme or a deeper meaning, um, something that uh, is happening internally, then you can usually find a beginning, middle, and end. And that's how it is with graphic memoirs, but those usually sort of come about in retrospect, where you're like, okay, what was the start of the story that I want to tell? What was the end? What did I learn from it? And, uh, and that's just, that's muscle memory. You sort of get better and better at it, get better at recognizing um, these like moments that you want to include and trying to find things that are universal, trying to find things that people will, uh, will connect to in your work. And that's, you know, that's, that's the good stuff. <laughs> that's what I want to get to. So, in some ways, because you are telling these stories about yourself and you are the main character, you, you kind of remind me of having the same problem that like John Green has with his vlog, right? So John Green does this, this <laughs> vlog with his brother and he's constantly talking to people on the phone and on the, on, on the videos. And as a result, people who watch these things think they know him like super well. They're like, he's like my best friend. <laughs> I know him so well. So when they meet him in person, they already have this association with him that he clearly cannot have with them because he's talking to them, but they can't talk back. It's not dissimilar from what you're doing. People clearly read your stuff and they're like, I know her. She's a, I know, I know this kind of person. So do you have, I'm not going to say a problem, but does this feeling of over familiarity is, can it be problematic? Like for example, if a person meets you once, they're going to obviously remember you. If you meet them two times, you're not necessarily going to be able to remember them just because you're meeting so many people. Um, and as I think, who was it? Like it was Tamora Pierce, I think, once said, like, I only have room in so much for people's names in my head and character names count. So every time I invent a character, a real name gets pushed out along the way. So yeah, I mean, is this a problem at all for you? Um, well, no, I think it's a problem more for people that meet me and feel uncomfortable that they have this one-sided connection to me. I'm very flattered, usually. People say like, oh, is it weird that I know like about your cat? And I'm like, no, that's great. Thanks. Let's talk about my cat. I love my cat. <laughs> and, um, I love your cat, too. Yeah, yeah, my cat. So, um, so for me, it's very flattering and I'm very honored. But yeah, that, the, the tough thing comes when people like meet me again at a convention and I'm seeing a few thousand faces and they're like, remember like four years ago when we met? And I'm just like, I'm really sorry. I probably had a great interaction with you. Yeah. Um, which, you know, is true of everybody at a convention. You meet somebody at a convention and then, you know, run into them again and you're like, what was your name? Which is why it's so great that people wear name tags at conventions. Oh, oh this doesn't have my name. No, on. this does not. Um, name tags are great. <laughs> um, and if, you know, even if you, if somebody is your like cousin, <laughs> remember my name is, just in case you forgot, such and such uh, is always so lovely and will make any, any person behind a table so grateful and happy <laughs> that you did that. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the only thing that gets in trouble. Um, 
I think it's really funny when people, it, it, rarely this happens, but some people recognize me and I'm always like, oh, you made my day. Um, more often people recognize my kid. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, that looks like baby pal. And I'm like, it is baby pal. <laughs> um, which I think people feel uncomfortable about because they, they're like, you know, oh, you know that toddler. <laughs> um, but you know, I'm always very flattered. That, you know, we've been very lucky. No one's been a kook. Um, and in, in terms of, right, yeah, like, uh, in terms of comics, you know, like, we're all, we're all kooks, so, <laughs> so the only kooks have been good, generally good kooks. Yeah. Do you ever wish your life was less exciting? Because <laughs> you have these things happen to you, and they make for good comics, and there's got to be, and I, I can't say that, like, when you're in the middle of something terrible happening to you, is there even any little part of your brain that goes, Oh, this is gonna be a good guy. <laughs> uh, it's horrible, and it shouldn't be happening. But, oh, yay, storyline! Like, uh, like, do you ever wish you had like a, just a really boring life? Um, I wish I had a more boring pregnancy. I will yeah, say that. That was a really exciting one. Yeah, yeah. a pretty exciting pregnancy, and that's never really a good thing. No. Um, I, uh, I really, I, I've always been interested in women's reproductive health, and I knew that I wanted to make a comic about it, and I thought it would be this, like, typical pregnancy story, and I thought, like, oh, it'll be, it'll make for a nice comic, it's about sort of transitioning into becoming a parent, and, like, you know, women's, uh, health, and, uh, reproductive health, and, um, so I thought that was really cool, and that was the book that I wanted to make originally, and then I ended up having this really, like, fraught pregnancy, and I almost died, and it was horrifying, and I remember being like, no, I have to draw this book. This is not the book I was gonna draw. Um, but in the end, like, I'm so, I'm so glad that I made that book, because it really talked about the things that I was very interested in at the heart of the idea of this book, which was reproductive health, and, um, and so sort of the medicalization of birth, and that became what the book was about. And, uh, you know, otherwise it would have just been like, here's a story about pregnancy. And that's, that's not how, it, it is actually pretty normal to have a very hard pregnancy and to almost die in childbirth, especially in the US where we have the highest maternal mortality rate of any developed nation. So this became what the book was about and it actually is pretty normal. It's not like it was exciting for me, but it's very typical. And it's like six times worse for women of color in terms of, nearly dying in childbirth, so, or actually dying in childbirth. Um, so this is what, you know, it's, it's not exciting. It's all very typical. Everything in the book is very typical um, for a lot of people. But I'm, I'm glad that you think it's exciting because I try to make it a good read. Yeah. Oh, it's a very good read. <laughs> it is a, it's an excellent book. If you guys haven't read Kid Gloves yet, go out uh, to your local library. And read them. Um, so, I'm very interested in how the perception of, of comics has changed, but I think the comic memoir has had a lot to do about that. For example, I'm sitting at the RA desk, you know, the Reader's Advisory Desk at the library, right? And I fill in like once a week down there. And this little old lady comes up, like little, like you know, reasoned old lady, she comes up and she's like, I was listening to NPR and that nice Jared Krasaska came on about his, about his new book, and, and I would like to read, I've never read a comic before, but I would like to read uh, that book of his. So little old ladies who have never read comics a day of their life, maybe the lock ones, she has done nothing. She comes up and she wants to read a full like graphic novel memoir about, a, you know, hey kiddo, it's not an easy read, that's a, that's a tough subject, but she like, wants to do it. And we now live in this sort of era where that's okay, where she doesn't feel like the stigma of like comics are bad um, or, you know, or, or lesser in some way. And I don't know why this has changed, but it, it, it seems to have. Now you've been making comics for a very long time. Have you noticed a change in the perception or reception of your book since you began to now? I mean, obviously you're better known now, but how they are used, how they are perceived. Have you seen changes? Yes, definitely. Um, when French Milk, my first book was published, it was shelved with travel books. Because <laughs> they sort of didn't know where to put it. Yeah. And I was like, really, I was really mad at the time. So I was like, I don't want to be a real graphic novelist. Um, and I thought they were just, they were just kind of like sh sh shoving it off onto the side. But uh, the really interesting thing that happened because of that was that people who were interested in travel writing, but not necessarily comics, would pick up the book and read it and sort of 
it would open up this new world of reading for them, that they would get into comics, they would see, you know, find other travel, graphic travelogues. And, um, and that was awesome for me because I was like this gateway book. And, uh, and that, that happened with Relish as well, where people who were interested in food writing, but not necessarily comics have picked it up and read it and then like gone on to read other comics. And what's really cool is that now there's like a ton of comics about food that people can read. And um, there's this great crossover. And, uh, I, I think that's a marriage made in heaven, so I was personally re really excited about it, and uh, et cetera. For weddings, people who are interested in not reading a wedding, they would read my book and get into weddings and get into comics and, and now women's health and reproduction. So I, uh, I really love that. I, I love that it's, it's sort of, uh, I, I, I'm helping break down that barrier a little bit, uh, that people who like don't read comics read it and then they're like, I've never read a comic before, and I'm like, well, let me <laughs> let me open this door for you and <laughs> and usher you into the clubhouse. And it's so great to see that clubhouse kind of falling down, and and the the lines blurring more and more, uh, and graphic novels being shelved right alongside other wonderful books. And uh, that's that's an amazing thing for me to be in this career right now, where I get to watch that transition happening. And it's interesting because I, I can't help but think that one of the reasons that this is sort of like this is prejudicing as comics is falling by the wayside is partly because of librarians and educators, pander, pander. And um, also because we, they've been around long enough that the, when people were kids, when Smile first came out by Randy Feldenmeyer, for example, you know, that was a while ago, um, you know, at least a good decade. And now the, the kids who read them are becoming the librarians and educators. And they are, in fact, you know, raising up the children to read more and more <laughs> than themselves. And it just spirals after that. So along those lines, um, whenever I have uh, a comic artist that I really, really like, say, a Lucy Nicely or a Kate Beaton, um, immediately what I want is what they do, but for kids. So the comic memoir, but for kids. And of course now um, that's becoming more common. So Lucy, are you making anything for kids? <laughs> Thanks for the setup, Betsy. You're welcome. <laughs> I am, in fact. I am working right now on my first middle grade graphic novel. It's part of a three book series. It is based, it is not technically a graphic memoir, but it's based on my childhood. Uh, being a indoor city kid who liked to stay inside and read and my parents split up and my mom moved us to a farm <laughs> where I had to be outside a lot and learn how to take care of like chickens and work at a farmer's market and that sort of thing. But not only that, she uh, started dating and got engaged to a man who had two daughters and suddenly I had siblings. I went from an only child to having step siblings. So it's about sort of feeling out of place and also uh, feeling out of place in my own family and about the dynamics that you have when you sort of have to become siblings with people. And it's based off of me and my stepsisters, uh, who I now as an adult, I'm very close to, but uh, at the time we were very different people and uh, it was a, a struggle becoming friends. You also have picture books. I do. Things that are coming out. Yes. Do you want to talk about the, the sure. new picture book you have? Yes, uh, I have a new book called You Are New that is out uh, like last two, as of last Tuesday. And it is a story about babies and what they can do. It started as a book, not much as it turned out. Babies cannot do much. Um, it started as a book that I made for my niece when she was born three and a half years ago. And it was about like, you know, you're, you gotta work on your resume because it's like, you're not, you don't have any, hmm skills applicable to <laughs> real life and uh, your cv baby yeah come on. um but then it sort of became more sweet and uh and now the book is really just about like what babies do all day they sleep and they eat and they make bad smells and and they scream and um you can put them in small places and that's very cute yeah, so <laughs> yeah it's great you just put them somewhere so uh, so that, that's the book that I made. It was inspired by my own son's infancy, and now, uh, now he's a toddler. So of course, now I'm going to be making toddler books. Uh, I have a book that I will be working on this summer that uh, is called, uh, tentatively called Looking for Walks, because my, um, my son likes to go on rock walk walks, <laughs> where he looks for rocks on a walk. <laughs> and he, uh, he lives in Chicago. So 
there's not a lot of like mineral <laughs> variety oh, to come upon here. So his rock collection is like a bottle cap <laughs> and <laughs> like a small wood chip that he found. And it, like his, he's a very urban child rock collection. It's really <laughs> amusing to me. So that's what it's going to be about. It's going to be about looking for rock, rocks. <laughs> rocks. Can rocks be in quotation? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> rocks. Um, I know you have you have, you have questions for me as well. I do. Um, but let's let's transition just with one last question to you because because okay. you are the star of my day. Um, so just one last question, just in terms of like these memoirs. So as a librarian, um, I did a little research as to where Kid Gloves is because my library is part of consortium. So we have a bunch of libraries that we can all borrow from each other and it's all very like back and forthy. And so if I don't know where to catalog something, I can look at the other libraries and be like, well, what are they doing? And so I was like, kid gloves, where are they putting kid gloves? Mostly in adult, but there were definitely places that were putting them only in the teen section. Now it shows a woman with the baby in her tummy. And I am not saying that there are not teenagers with the baby in their tummy, though most certainly are, but it seems strange to only put it in the teen section. So what does your readership like look like? Like, is it a mix of teens and maybe kids and adults, or is it mostly adults, but just a couple teens? Like, what's your general sense of who reads you? A lot of ladies. A lot of ladies. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of ladies, yeah. a lot of lady readers, which I love. Um, it varies. I always get a few kids coming to my events, which is awesome. Uh, now, I'm very pleased to say that a lot of people bring their babies to my events, which is my favorite. <laughs> so I have a, lot, a large baby readership. Is what okay, very good. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's always really interesting because uh, I now have these books that I've written for all my 20s, and I feel like I have people that are connecting with my early work who are like teenagers, and I have people connecting with my later work who are, you know, grandmothers were remembering their own experiences of becoming a mother and that's so great. I have like I have this huge gamut of readers and it's so awesome to see and I, I always really love it. Generally my events tend to be dominated by women in their 30s in classes <laughs> but that's most book events I would say. Um, but I always really really love it when it's like a huge beefy guy comes up and says, I just love your work. And I'm like, thank you. That's, awesome. That's so great. Um, so, you know, it's, it's pretty much everybody. I, I love, uh, I love particularly hearing stories about um, sort of my typical readers that bring their books home and then they're like, you know, their husbands or their partners pick it up. Um, I got this email last week that was like, I brought Kid Gloves home when I was reading and I really loved it. And my 15 year old son picked it up and he really loved it and he read it. And, and I was like, yes, that's awesome. That is so cool. It's so amazing to see a, like, a teenage boy reading about reproductive health and this stuff is so important and it's not being taught in schools. And I'm so happy that this reached that kid. That's so great. Um, so I don't know, I, I love that it's shelved in teen stuff. I love that it's shelved, shelved in adult stuff. I wish it was shelved in every genre. I wish it was shelved with the pregnancy stuff because I know that this is the book that I would have loved to pick up um, That's true. when I was looking for books about pregnancy when I was pregnant. So, um, you know, parenting, uh, all, that, all that jazz, every, every, every genre. <laughs> It, it, I'm literally sitting here going like, what was the call number that we put on it? I don't remember. Is it in parenting or is it in memoir? I don't know. I don't think this is one problem. See, this is a problem that we had with Nathan Hale's Hazardous Tales, right? So Nathan Hale's Hazardous Tales, best historical comics for kids of all time. And y'all need to check them out. But um, his problem is because they're nonfiction topics, they end up in like 50 different places, right? So one's about the Donner Dinner Party, so it's in the Donner Dinner Party. One's a biography of uh, Harriet Tubman, so that goes in the biography section. So only in a couple places where they've figured out what to do with nonfiction comics do they actually put them all in the same place. Generally, the traditionally, what we do is, what's the topic? Well, let's see, the topic of this one is food. We put it in the food section. This one is kid gloves that goes in the pregnancy. So the person who comes and wears, wears the new Lucy Nisley section isn't going to find that. So they have to go on a treasure hunt. You, yes, you have to go on a treasure hunt. You have to go on a scavenger hunt. And a lot of people I have found do not have the time or inclination to go on a scavenger hunt. Um, so this is a problem that we're dealing with. Some people have created new non-fiction graphic sections, um, both in their public libraries and their school libraries. And that is a pretty good, good solution. Hey.
Yeah. Um, so that's different, obviously. Librarian extraordinaire. And I have, um, I actually got kind of carried away talking, like, yeah, you got a whole page. I know, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> um, but I love libraries, I'm obsessed, and I, like, I always have a lot of passion for libraries. So um, I wanted to ask, what, from, from an author's point of view or a bookseller's point of view, what kind of thing gets a book beloved by librarians? Well, I think what I said earlier about if a child has been raised in a library or bookstores and then becomes a librarian or works in a bookstore or something, um, or a teacher for that matter, uh, then you pretty much incline towards the things that you've read before and loved. So there's that to a certain extent. And then there's, yeah, so what are the things that get loved by librarians? I mean, it's things like this. When people, when librarians are active and they get off their butts and they go to conferences, you are all for doing so, um, because traditionally that was not the way the librarians would, would buy their books. Traditionally, you would, well, even before we had Baker and Taylor carts and, and things like that, you would get your stack of your review journals and you'd read through them and be like, I will buy everything with a star. And, uh, and then I may buy a couple other things on the topics that I know that my readers want. And I will never have to leave this table. <laughs> I will just do all my ordering right here and I'll sit up, put my feet off, uh, my shoes off, it'll be awesome. And then, um, the internets appeared with their series of tubes and we were like, oh great, now we can get like automatic carts of review titles and we can just go through those. But you only see what makes it into the review journals, right? And certainly that is, especially when it comes to comics, that's an itty bitty teeny weeny little itty bitty like section of the whole. So now we actually have to stand up and walk to a conference if we are lucky enough to be anywhere near one as cool as C2E2, panda panda, and, uh, and see what is actually coming out that our readers want. So what do we like? Uh, what do we love? We love the stuff that, that we care about, that, that, that we can see fills the needs of our readers to a certain extent. And that, you know, we, we, we love and hate the term gatekeepers, but we kind of are gatekeepers. And we have like this sense of we want what's good. We want what feels a need, and is also good. And it's a, it's a real push and pull and kind of a tug with like, what is available and what can I have to build need and what is good. And they don't always intersect, but that's how we do it. Um, off of that, what, uh, what sort of needs have you recognized in your readership? Well, I don't think I'm gonna surprise anyone uh, at all by saying we need diverse books because that is something that I think by now we have all pretty much learned. Um, I haven't been to library school in calculating 15 years, but um, when I was in library school, that was not a huge topic of conversation. When I took my little class on collection development, it was pretty much like reviews are important. And that, that is how you order. You order from the reviews. If it doesn't have a review, you don't order it. Um, so, and I hope that has changed to a certain extent um, because and this is very interesting. On the kids' side of things, on the kids and teens' side of things, we are seeing big shifts, right? We're seeing like more and more imprints, uh, um, you know, focusing on historically uh, disadvantaged, you know, voices that have not been heard. Um, the own voices hashtag has been used a lot with the kids and the teens stuff. On the adult side, glacial, so slow. Like I can walk through my children's room and I can see just like title after title after title, you know, by people with the lived experience of the characters in the books. And I'm like, this is really cool. I walk through my adult section and I'm the one who buys the adult section. And I'll be like, one, one, it is not at the same scale. So really what we're looking for on both the kids and the adult side is the same stuff. We're looking for a wide range of voices and experiences, and we're seeing it way more on the kids' sides than we're seeing on the adult sides these days. What about the comic sides? Again, you got to kind of come here or to the comic book stores or... I mean the diversity. The diversity. Yeah. diversity. Yeah. It's getting there. Yeah. Um, there's Iron Spike to a certain extent and stuff like, you know, she's a woman and things like that, but it's, I mean, it's out there, but you have to find it and it is not being highlighted. Yeah. Uh, it's not being highlighted by the review journals. It is, it is most certainly not because, partly because the comic world is so separate from the library world, right? Like 
I've, I've heard, you know, the, the woman who, writes, who does Iron Spike, you know, she talks about how she has to explain to her friends in comics, like, no, if you can get into libraries, here's how many libraries are in America. Here's how many comic book shops, right? So there's just so many libraries. If you can get into libraries, you've got your set, man, you're made. But it is really hard because to get into a library, to submit to a review journal, you have to do it like a certain amount ahead of time, like months beforehand. And in the comic world, it can go really fast. It can be like, wrote the comic, comics out, boom. At what? I have to like submit this like four months before the book comes out? That's not how we work. So you don't get a lot of the professional journals who the librarians read seeing these things, which means that a lot of these voices are being completely missed because how are we hearing about them? We have to look in a bunch of different places. We need just the lovely list that says, look here, 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 here every month. And that list, if it exists, please somebody advertise it widely because we need that list. Yeah, I want that list to exist. Yeah. Um, other than this list suddenly existing, what do you think, uh, I've like gone off my list. <laughs> That's my, what I don't care, yeah. But how do you think that the comics world could integrate more with the library world? It's, it would take, I mean, the library world and the comic world, they can exist. Um, the library world wants the comic world to be more in the libraries, right? They, they want, the easy answer is they want them in the review journals. Um, but failing that, they want to hear about these titles that are coming out. They want, you know, more stuff at ALA, you know, the big library conferences, things like that, you know, you know, advertisements in like um, all these journals and stuff like that. Because unless you are, you know who online to follow, you know what voices you want to hear more from, things like that, you're not going to necessarily hear them. The comic world, I, I do feel like they need to reach out a little more to librarians, but here's the thing, not every librarian likes comics. There's a whole swath of librarians who do not care two bits. So you might have like a comic book artist who's like, well, I'll appeal, they, they said I should appeal to my local library. Well, they go in and the librarian's like, we don't approve those books. <laughs> and they're like, okay, so much for that plan. <laughs> All right, I thought I was supposed to go into libraries. Clearly not the case. Mm -hmm. So you get this real divide. Even today, even with the rise of how popular these books are, you still have that some old, I won't say old school, old school librarians still do not feel that a comic is worthy literature. Mm -hmm. It is not distinguished. Because, you know, as Mc, I love Scott McCloud's understanding comics, as he explains it, we have great art and we have great writing, but when we put the two of them, you know, oh, it's something lesser in somehow. Uh, I don't know how that chemical creation happens, but apparently it's lesser as a result. And uh, this is simply not true. I agree. Um, and I will say that in addition to this, um, I go to a, a lot of library events. I try and do as many as I can every year. Um, but I wanted to ask what can an author do to make for a good library event? Ooh, well, that is an interesting question. Um, first of all, figure out the AV situation. <laughs> that is, man, we had the picture book um, author illustrator, Sherry Dusky Rinker, definitely come in. And I'm not always on the ball with the whole AV. She walks into the room. She's like, okay, what's your AV setup? I'm like, uh, I think we have a laptop here. She's like, I brought my own setup cord. I know how to work this. Boom, 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 boom. I turn on the projector, instantly it came on the screen. That never happens. And she's like, what's your sound situation? I'm like, I, don't, I think there's a cord here that goes in there. She's like, boom, 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 boom. Like the sound worked instantly. A little loud, a little hot, but it was okay. I was like, Ugh. so know your AV, know your dongles, know your connecting <laughs> things, and assume that the place that you're going to go to doesn't know how to operate anything. Um, and I think that's how she goes through life. And I think that's why her, her events are just so good awesome. because she doesn't have to worry about like, do you have a, a clicker to get from one slide to the other or will I have to stand behind the podium and press the button? Could you press the button? Oh wait, no, we haven't timed how you're going to press the button. Now you've accidentally gone four slides ahead. We've all been there, right? So the person who knows their tech, if you don't have tech, um, that's okay too. Find out if they have like the big thing where you draw and you know and, and a marker and something like that. And then don't be the artist who, after you draw on there, rips it up afterwards because your art will be worthless after you die because you've done so many of these in schools. I know people who do that. Um, yeah, I'll name names later. And uh, you know who you are. 
Um, so yeah, it's basically for a, just a good author event, you know, just be in contact with the people, but you know, it's, it's not always up to you. Sometimes you go to, you know, sometimes it's like a super busy library and they don't have time to thank all the thanks through. And so expect the worst. Oh. That's, that's my advice. And then you'll do fine. Yeah, that seems like, yeah, yeah, yeah right. expect the worst. Expect the worst. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was the worst author event you ever had at your library? <laughs> so, it wasn't an author, it was a documentary on the Phantom Tollbooth, which, by the way, if you ever see it, is the greatest documentary of all time. What's Just go online. It's called Phantom Tollbooth, and then I keep trying to remember it, what the subtitle was. It was something like Beyond the Tollbooth, but it wasn't that. If you Google Phantom Tollbooth documentary, you can buy it from their site. I just bought three copies from my library, actually, because I realized that we didn't have any. Because it was like a really small thing, but they did such a stellar job on it. And all these interviews with like Pfeiffer and Juicer, and they're just like so funny. So they were gonna show it, they were gonna premiere it at my library. I was so freaking excited because they had done it with the New Yorker Fil Film Festival, but it had sold out. So this was gonna be like the next showing after that, right? So they come in to do it and it was on a Saturday. And of course, for some reason, my tech guy doesn't work on Saturdays, right? So this is in New York. And um, so we fought and cannot get the projector to work. So people in the audience are sitting for an hour waiting for this, right? Because we can't get the tech right. We finally get the tech right. One of the bulbs had burned out in the projector and everything was purple, like the whole thing. <laughs> now, I didn't care two bits and the audience didn't care. We were like, whatever, it's purple. We don't care. It's like Harold Purple Crown meets Phantom Tolkien, whatever, we don't care. But the, these are filmmakers who like spend hours who are like, it looks a little green. <laughs> Bring up the side, you know, that they were in, mid like you could see their bodies like contorting in pain the whole time because your eyes get used to it you're like oh the world's purple um but they did not care so they they were in horrible pain the entire time worst event but it did play so i'm going to take some credit for the fact that it did play even though i did nothing um yeah that was that was one of the worst oh that's bad it was so bad wow. it was so bad oh my god okay um what was the best Oh, see, that's like naming my ch like which of the children you love the most. Like, what was the best word author of all the time? Um, that's a super hard call. Okay, what's the best type? Okay, the best type. Oh, well, I mean, that Sherry Dusky Ranker that I just mentioned, like she, like because not only okay, not only did she have like the tech set up with head sound and all that fun stuff. Um, she came early, so and then she. She was interacting with the, cause she, okay, I don't care what program you're doing. If it involves kids or teens, you're gonna get a three-year-old. It's just, it's like <laughs> odds, right? So you're like, this is for five to 10 year olds or this is nine to 12 year olds. And then you get the person with like the, the basically like the baby with the snot. I was like, <laughs> he's really mature. I'm sure he'll be good. That's like kid. he's reading at a fourth grade level. <laughs> and then you have the and so she knew, so she, yeah, she does a picture book. So right there, you're doomed. It's just yeah, gonna be like yeah. wall to wall babies, you know? And she would, she went into the audience and she was like with the kids and she would like, she would mentally think to herself like, I'm going to mention a toilet. Which of these children will think the toilets is funny? That one. <laughs> and then she'd be like, and then there was a toilet. And the kid's like, ah! And then, you know, she moves on. So she knew the room. She's walking back and forth. She's, you know, she can tell like, this is the kind of kid who does not want a, an adult stranger in their face. This is the kind of kid who craves attention. I mean, ah, you know, and then when she's asking questions, she's not just calling on like the boys who have their hands, you know, here's the quiet girl over here, like call on her. So, you know, she, oh, it was good. It was clear that she had done this like hundreds and hundreds of times because she had the whole thing down. It was very good. So that is my favorite kind of so what you're saying is practice like yeah. insane amounts. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. What, yes. <laughs> yes. What do um what do you do if there is a bad audience member mm. at your library? So this happens all the time. I used to run these children's literary salons, which were um, adults talking about children's books for adults. Um, and then once in a while you get like a 10-year-old who wanders in and it's like, whoa, you got it. And, runs out. and we I would all oh, oh man, I had this woman, I called her the troll because she systematically, she would not come every time, but I finally got to the point where I could recognize her so I wouldn't call on her anymore. Because every time I did, she would somehow manage to insult my panelists. I don't know how she managed it, but she would always 
like just like sit there and then be like, you said this, which I find terribly offensive. And, you, and then it wouldn't be a question. It was like when kids don't understand what a question is and you're like, here's what a question is. And they're like, I have a dog, you know? It was a basically adult version of that, which is just like, you said something terribly offensive, respond. <laughs> and it's like, what did And I finally learned to be like, oh, it's not her. Um, but when you have like, yeah, when you have like a, like, like a kid, right? So a kid who's just like, you know, the author's trying to do their thing and the parent who is just on their phone and they don't care. And then their kid is like running circles like as fast as they can in front of the author until they like vomit on the floor. That is pretty typical. Um, you try to avoid that as much as possible. And there are things you can do. Like if you are doing it in a room with books and the books are behind the author, I would put chairs in front of the books so that the kid does try to get to them, they got to get through the chairs first <laughs> and it's super hard. Um, so yeah, you, but, and then you can speak to the parent. I don't know if parents don't care. Sometimes you can kind of like urge the child off to the side. It's, there are like a million, we all have different techniques for the depth, the tools and techniques, but you really have to have some, like a, like a librarian or a library worker who's on your side from the start and knows how to handle that situation. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. so like I said, my books have kind of a diverse range in age. And um, so I, I have a lot of events where um, there's like babies and there's grandmothers and, <laughs> and everybody in between. Um, so I have to come up with all of these, like, you know, I have like worksheets that I try and get the kids to do while I do my thing, and uh, stickers, and they, like, you know, good. swag, free stuff, <laughs> um, seems to help, toys, uh, puzzles, that sort of thing. But anyway, yeah, and then I also, like, the, the worst, like, library <laughs> event that I ever did, there was a guy who thought that, um, thought that um, <laughs> my books were bad because they didn't have a male perspective. <laughs> so they're bad. And, he, and I was like, well, behind me is a library full of male perspective books <laughs> that you are welcome to choose from. These are just mine. And I'm sorry that I don't have a male perspective for you, but literally thousands and thousands of books behind me will cater directly to your needs. Um, Have some so notes. I really think that this is fine. And he said, well, that's because you're a woman. <laughs> and I was like, cheerio. Um, and then uh, the librarians were so apologetic afterwards. And I was like, it's fine, whatever. He's, he's, he sucks. But, um, <laughs> but you know, that, that, that's what happened, you know. And they were like, he comes to every event. We don't know how to stop him. Yeah. He's like this at every event. Yeah. Horrible. And I was like, oh, man. You Really bad now. <laughs> You're like, I'm glad that I can handle them, but oh man, I know that guy. I, I, I know that guy. Yeah, it was, <laughs> and it was a library room full of like people that like like had come to see me and like buy books. So it was the wrong room. I mean, he was like appealing. He's like, what about a male perspective? And everyone was like, ooh, yes. <laughs> um, so you know, it was fun. Um, okay, what else do I have? Uh, oh, I wanted to ask. So I was very lucky to grow up um, at where like libraries were just part of my upbringing, and I, you know I spent a lot of time at libraries as a child. But um, I like a lot of kids don't, and then there are these libraries that are desperate for kids to come in. Do you think that it is? Um, <laughs> so this is the problem that I have as an author because I want to go to these uh, these libraries, but they don't have the resources to invite me. Um, they don't they don't have somebody there who like finds. The graphic novel lists people who are there with stickers and workbooks and like excited to come to libraries. How do I help? How do I help as an author? How do I help these libraries that need my help? That is like a million dollar question, right? So, right. So like as an author, like, a, you know, a portion of your income is coming from appearances, right? And uh, sometimes libraries don't understand that or, or Bookstores sometimes don't, well, bookstores understand it, but the libraries don't always understand it. So they're kind of like, or you know, teachers sometimes too, they're kind of like, hey, could you for free, like, talk to my, our students? And you want to so badly because it's, you know, you're reaching out to kids and, and you're making them aware of the stuff. And that's awesome. But at the same time, you got to make a living. And it's like that duality. So then you've got, yeah, then you've got these libraries who want you desperately. They would pay top dollar if they have the top dollar, which they most certainly do not. They might have a really small programming budget and they just can't do it. And I mean, I've seen it done a couple different ways. Like sometimes if it's like, a, if it's, if it's personal to you, if it's like, 
where you grew up or something like that, um, you can make the exception to the rule there. But to help them as a whole, I mean, the, the best way to help them, uh, it would honestly be, and this is so much work, it would be to find the grants that they could apply to, to get authors to come in, because they do exist. There are all these different like ALA grants and other kinds of grants where you can um, apply for them and then get the money to get like an author into your school or into your library to do it. But the amount of work and research that that takes, man, I knew this library, right? I was, I was living in New York and I went to visit this library in the Bronx. And it was like this kind of neighborhood where like everyone's like, whoa, whoa, whoa it's a dangerous neighborhood. You don't want to go, you don't want to go there at night. Huh? And um, yeah, the kids are going to freaking school there. And this librarian was like, she was like the greatest librarian I've ever met in my entire life. She was literally a superhero because she knew grants, right? So she'd gotten like the Robin Hood grant. So her library was oh, freaking amazing. It had tons of brand new computers because she'd gotten a different grant for that. She'd gotten grants to get like author appearances. She'd gotten, like she had a picture of her and like, Laura Bush on the wall together, like, you know, because Laura Bush had a grant that she had gotten. So this woman just like, boom, boom, boom. And of course, she told me, like, as I was leaving that day, and she, all the kids were just like, yeah. As I was leaving, she was like, of course, I'm retiring next year. And I just wanted to grab her and be like, not allowed. <laughs> you must work until you die. Um, so, but you know, it's, uh, but of course, I don't even know how she did it. Nobody has time for that. Like these like school librarians especially are like working up the wazoo, they have no time. So I, the, the answer is So I think what we've discovered here in this conversation is that there needs to be like a comics library force team. Yes. Right? That right. will like make the list. Maybe like an ALA graphic novel round table. Hey. <laughs> like how you think. Yeah. You want to talk about that? I don't know as much about it as I should. That's, yeah. Actually, I should like call up Amy who's in the hallway and be like, yeah. Amy, what's the deal with the comic uh, graphic novel round table, Amy? But uh, she's way too far away from me. So. Yeah. Um, no, but anyway, so ALA is making great strides though, uh, because they don't have an ALA accredited graphic novel award. <laughs> too many awards already. We can't put another one on there. The stickers will be useless. Like, no, we could, we could have another one, right? Only it would have to be a little more broad than that. It couldn't be just like, a comics award, right? It would have to be like an like a illustrated book award because you've got all these weird things like Hugo Cabret and like novels that use like um, like the assassination of Brangwen Spurge, like these books that use text and image in like fantastic, fabulous ways, including comics. That needs an award. They can't win dang thing unless once in a while they get a prince, but that's only if it's like on the YA side. Once in a while they get a, like a, a, a Newberry or a Calica, but that's a super rare occurrence. So we have all these amazing comics that they are not getting ALA awards, and this is a problem. Um, so more can be done. Excellent. Yes. All right. Yeah. Um, well, I think I think yeah, we're pretty much out of time. So okay. Should we just run through questions right now. I don't know. I guess so. I don't know if we can hear them. Um, we can probably take a couple questions if people have questions. Yeah, we got a little time. Does anybody have any questions for Lucy here? Okay. Okay. Speak loud so I can hear. The question is, uh, how did Lucy market Relish because the age range in the book is so wide? Um, I did a lot of library events. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that's, that was exactly what that book needed. Uh, I did a lot of library events, which is great because I, I really like those. And um, that way people could come from all ages. I did a lot of school events and the book came out in the spring, like right before kids got out of school. So those were not as successful because the kids were like asleep. <laughs> um, and then I would do bookstore events too, and that was for the adults. But uh, what's great is that I I was lucky enough to at the time work with Gina Gagliano, who was the uh, marketing and publicity. I know, and now I, I now I'm also working with her at uh, Random House, where she's working now. 
So um, she's wonderful and she knows comics and she knows how to sell them and she knows how to market them and she just did a really, really amazing job. And she sent me specifically to very food centric cities where I was able to market the books to people who were really into food, which is perfect. Um, also because she loved, loves food and we like have that in common. So she'd be like, okay, when you go to San Francisco, I know you're there to sell a book, but you have to go to this restaurant and try this food. So it was an amazing tour because I just went to like these amazing food places and I ate really good food and I talked about food. And um, I think my, one of my favorite was in San Francisco because I had, I had like four, three or four events that day where it was like school, library, school, bookstore, <laughs> like comics museum or something. It was like this insanely full day and I had no time to really go and eat really good food but uh, they have great food trucks there. So I stopped at a food truck in between one of my events and I was like, perfect, I'm gonna go to this food truck. And the person in the food truck was like, oh, <laughs> I have your book and I'm reading it right now. And I was like, oh my God, this is the best day of my life. <laughs> She's like, could you sign it? I was like, yeah. I like signed my book right there and, um, and then I got like delicious food truck food. So, um, so relish was really fun to market because it was like food and anybody who likes food, uh, which was really great. Uh, so I, you know, I didn't have a lot to do with it. It was mostly Gina's brilliance, but I did my best and, and tried to sell it to everyone. But that's part of why libraries are really important for particularly books like mine that really cross these genres and, uh, and mediums and, and make people uh, sort of step outside their reading comfort zone. Uh, because they're not necessarily going to come to a comic book store reading. They're not necessarily going to come to like, you know, a traditional bookstore reading or a, a school or a school reading. So, uh, so libraries are really the place where I've found my best audiences, I think. We can take one last question, if anyone has one. Back there, sir. Uh, do you have a dream project or a dream team up that you'd love to do if like money wasn't an option, <laughs> networking wasn't an option? This is a good question. Does she have a dream project or dream pair up that she would like to do? Um, well, many, of course. Uh, I always have like 50 projects that I want to get to. But I will say that this book, Kid Gloves, this book that just came out, has been a dream of mine since I was a child to make a book about reproductive health. And uh, it, so this has been like, a total dream come true to go to places and talk about this book and talk about women's health and it's it's like the greatest point in my career so far up to now um but if you want to hear like fun things that i'd want to do someday uh i of course would really love to do more work about food i'd love to work with a chef who knows things about food that i don't know that i could like learn from them and make comics about what they have to teach me um i would love to do uh more work about women's reproductive health and, and talk about uh that with a doctor with a, um, a midwife somebody who knows more about that than i do and learn from them um i'm at a point in my career where i've like maybe run out of life events to make books about. <laughs> so I'm like, turn into the experts. Like, what can I learn to make books about? Um, so that's, that's like the dream now that I get to make books that aren't necessarily about myself. <laughs> so I, I'm really looking forward to that in my career, to get to make more books and talk about these things that I'm passionate about, about food and about uh, reproductive health. I would like to thank you, Lucy, so much for joining us today. <laughs> thank, you. thank you all of you for coming. I think Amy may have some words. I know the live stream can see that you, Lucy. <laughs> hey, live stream. Um, I'm going to talk from the podium, so I'll uh, you put your phone away. <laughs> Do you want us to? I can turn yeah. it. Like turn it. Okay. Yeah, this can work. There we go. There we go. There you go. Yeah. I want to thank Lucy so much for being here. This was amazing. And the two of your conversations, I feel like you need your own show or something. <laughs> Yay! Podcast. <laughs> you have an amazing podcast. I but do. like a, a, a key guest or something. But, um, I want to thank yeah. everybody. Those of you in the room, I'm really sorry I'm kneeling right now. I just want to make sure people on the live stream see me. Uh, thank you all for attending our first live stream. Just want to have a reminder Lucy is going to be signing in the first second booth at 12 o'clock. First second booth is 516. Did I get that correct? 516? Yes. Um, and huge thanks to Betsy as well. You may have seen copies on the table. Right. This is the best books list that Betsy implemented at the Edmondson Public Library. Um, Betsy and I had the great uh, privilege to work with each other for a long time at NYPL. 
And books for kids, um, reading list, recommended reading list, one of the best things you can do to promote reading and that sort of cross-genre reading uh, comics, which as we know are a fantastic format for storytelling. We should involve all readers. Um, thank you so much. We have our networking session for the graphic novel and comics roundtable coming up right after the keynote. We have fantastic swag bags, so please stick around. If you want to get more involved with the graphic novels roundtable, we have a pop-up library here on the Comic-Con floor. All three days of C2E2, we are in booth 2063, a good landmark, Artist Alley, we're right by aisle Z. So 2063, we have greater visits going on so much throughout the weekend. Thank you so much. And again, thank you so much, Lucy and Betsy. My pleasure. It's such thank a pleasure. You. <laughs> um, and everyone, we're going to close out. We're just going to flip the room for the networking session, but please stick around. Thanks so much to everyone. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> hey, have you heard of Dollar's Chips? No. So you down for dinner on Monday? Yes. All right. Yeah. All right, let's go. Everyone's like, you know.